Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome today the legendary pianist, Ruth Lenczynska, who will share with us her thoughts and her reflections, her memories, also with Chopin, Polish composer. And as the artistic and executive director of the uh, Chopin and Friends Festival, I will ask a couple of things regarding music of this wonderful composer. And Ruth will open this year our festival, 23rd Festival of Polish Consulate. We are very much looking forward for her performance uh, in November uh, this year. So first of all, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I would like to ask you, Ruth, how have you been during the last uh, pandemic year? So how have you been? Have you practiced with books? Yes, I've practiced, have learned new things, mm -hmm. and enjoyed living in Pennsylvania in the countryside instead of in my New York apartment. Oh, so you are now in Pennsylvania. Oh. Yes. Oh, where in Pennsylvania? Where? Where? Mm -hmm. A little small town called Anvil. Anvil. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. I am not even sure it is on the map because it is just a <laughs> very small rural uh, town. And I can see from my window, beautiful green lawn surrounded by green trees. And there are little animals like squirrels. <laughs> and there was even an albino squirrel for a while who entertained us, but he has disappeared. So I miss him. But, uh, oh, we had uh, birds, we had uh, all kinds of uh, flying geese going uh, in large groups. And also we had a Mr. and Mrs. Goose living mm -hmm. in the backyard in the, the little pool at the bottom of the yard. So this is a very nice place to be, and there's a good piano, so I practice. You practice, but do you have a, uh, which piano do you have? What's your favorite piano? What's well, the... I have actually for home, in my home in uh, New York, I keep two pianos. I keep the Bersendorfer, the only piano I ever bought new, mm -hmm. and also a Hamburg Steinway, which uh, I love very much. So you have the Hamburg one, not the New York one, right? No, I prefer the Hamburg. Uh -huh. You prefer the Hamburg one. Well, that's also very interesting. Yes. But how about now the place where you are now? Which piano do you have? Well, I have a New York seven foot stein. Mm -hmm. Oh, so New York. This fairly is new, York. fairly new. So fairly. it is a good piano. Okay, that's wonderful. But maybe can you can tell us also, because you mentioned when we had a correspondence mm -hmm. that you're going to have a concert in Washington DC, right? Yes, yes, yes. And so that's upcoming also event for you. Well, I am waiting for His Excellency, our Polish ambassador, mm -hmm. to recover from a foot injury. He had an operation on his foot, mm -hmm. and he, we want him to be all well again. And so we, ha we are waiting for this to happen. And when it does, that's when we will have the concert. Mm -hmm. We don't have an exact date for it yet, but uh, I have a nice program for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you will play probably Chopin there, right? I, I bet. Well, I will play a lot of Chopin. A lot yeah. of Chopin, a lot of Chopin. But is Chopin your favorite composer or you don't have your favorite one? That's a I, difficult question, but... Well, I have favorite composers every three months. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it changes and for a while it was Beethoven and then for a while Mozart and then for a while Bach. Right now Bach is taking precedence over everything. Because oh, okay. I have, uh, my hostess is expecting to be a grandmother. Mm -hmm. And we do not yet know the sex of the baby. And so I am preparing for that baby a complete book of uh, Bach two-part inventions mm -hmm. so that it will acquire a good, solid foundation, a love for Bach. Mm. 
have you ever been also to maybe Germany, like this Leipzig or the, uh, you know, the place Eisenach where Bach was born, probably? Well, yes, I went on a tour at one time. Mm -hmm. and I did actually see the church where Bach worked. Sure. And I saw a cafe across from this church, which could have been Zimmerman's at his time, but there was no sign of the name of the cafe. Mm -hmm. But it was in this atmosphere that Bach created so much. That's, yes, that's always great to see those places, to feel the spirit of this time. But, but you know, you mentioned, I, have a, I also want to show, because this is a great book, which is always a great, for, for pianists, the music at your fingertips, Yes. You, you, asked, you, you mentioned here also about practicing, which was very important for me, practicing number um, without the piano. So it is called silent keyboard practice, right? Yes. I, this is chapter number 12 in this, in this book. So how do you feel? Do you practice more now without the piano? And because that's also a very important part. And I think it's amazing you mentioned about this because... Well, I'm very interested in composing, composer, I'm also interested in that. Mm -hmm. And we very much work without, actually, always in the head. But that's great that you send about this, that practicing without the piano is so important. It's so, very important. Yes. I do not trust a memory that cannot go through what I need to play without mm -hmm. the instrument being there. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. It has to be in my mind each hand alone and both together. Mm -hmm. I need that in my mind. So in your imagination, you see that, right? And you also see all of those hands like a, like a conductor here in all the orchestras, That's instruments. That's yes, but so you practice a lot, right? In your head nowadays. My, yes. Right, right. So, but I have a question because you started with amazing and very famous, of course, pedagog, I didn't mention at the beginning by Egon Petri, Arthur Schnabel, but in France, Alfred Cortot, also Sergei Rachmaninoff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to ask you, and also Hoffman, right? Hoffman, very That's important. For a long time ago. Yeah, for a long time. Yes, but you know, the Hoffman, which is also mentioned about these three ways of practicing that we always say to the pianist, with instrument, without the instrument, and uh, without the instrument, with the score, and without the score, right? Yes. So those three ways of uh, practicing. So do you prefer, do you like to practice um, with the score mostly nowadays, or you, you, you want to practice your memory? So you do uh, like without the score. So I, have a, I would like to ask about this process of when you, you so learn new pieces, for example. In the beginning, mm -hmm. the way I practice is I have the score. In yes. one hand alone, a mm -hmm. small section, I will learn. And then I will learn with the other hand alone, just mm -hmm. a very small section. And then I will put the two hands together. Very often, I form a kind of idea of the meaning of the piece, just section by section. But my mind will change. I will try one day, one idea on this. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I reject that idea and take another idea and see if that works. Mm -hmm. And Always changing. I keep changing, changing, changing until I find an idea for the whole piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I have something to work with, to start with anyway. Mm -hmm. it takes a long time. And the there is no final uh, idea for the piece because it changes. I had approached a piece now on top of many, many previous ideas that I had. And sometimes it's quite different from what I heard in the past. Sometimes it isn't so different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very interesting process, but you know, you also 
uh, talk about the flexibility of the process of learning. Yes. That's fascinating because also in the book, you, you explain the way of listening that we are ourselves. We can always listen with, we don't need to have like a guidance of the others. We can have our taste and we have to learn how to listen, but we always have to be very open-minded for all kinds of music. So you as a teacher professor for so many years, uh, you mentioned that all kinds of music, even the choral music yes. Yes, for listening or uh, for learning. So you as a professor for piano for so many years, I'm sure you uh, emphasize different styles in music mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for the, your students. But do you think that you always experiment? Yeah, you always discover new ways? Do you always yes. feel it? Well, I try to ask right. them so that they form their ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't impose my ideas on them. Oh, see. Mm -hmm. So, so but, they find. They find. They find their own way eventually. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I make suggestions, but I don't impose my idea on them. Sometimes they ask and ask and mm -hmm. ask. Say, questions. Oh, if you can't think of something better than this by next week, I'll tell you what to do. Mm. <laughs> Usually by next week they have <laughs> something. So you always inspire in a way of the way of thinking how students can yeah. think and maybe they can be teachers for themselves. There was also a beautiful thing here. You mentioned that Alfred Corto mentioned when you played yeah. in your, his memory, right? I remember when I was reading the book that he told you okay, now think about this play for yourself as you are the teacher that you want to show this to me. And it was very different. Just the one sentence, right? Change a lot of that. But it also teaches us that we can be, I don't know if you agree, but I think it's wonderful quote that we can be teacher for ourselves. Then we have our own life to be teachers for ourselves. We, and we have to learn how to be teachers. And this is a wonderful quote. Can you tell a little bit more about the story? I was so interested about this. Well, for instance, I listened this morning to an old, old, old recording of the B flat minor nocturne, first nocturne of Chopin. Of Chopin. Mm -hmm. da -da 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 -da. Yeah, of course. And Opus I mean, 9, Opus 9. Yes. It's a beautiful piece. Ornamentation. And in yeah. that piece, there are many, many meanings. Mm -hmm. Actually, historically speaking, when Chopin wrote that nocturne, he had in his mind, according to what I read, he was thinking of the river, the Seine River, S-E-I-N-E, -E, that runs through Paris. Mm -hmm, yes. And he was thinking of going down as you can underneath the bridge. You take the steps all the way down and you can walk alongside of that river. And he thought he was writing a composition mm -hmm, that would signify the Seine River as running smoothly, smoothly in the moonlight, reflecting the moonlight, and himself walking beside it and just enjoying this river walk. And in fact, when he took it to the publisher, Playel, Playel said, oh, I like this piece. What do you want to call it? And Chopin said, I want to call it a song because it is a song dedicated to the river Sin. Mm. And the publisher, that's, that's a piano piece. You can't call it that. We have to think, give it a better name. And Chopin said, well, that's what it means to me. You can name it whatever you want. And so the publisher said, well, you know, the, this Irish person, John Field, Mm, has been yes. having a lot of success and selling a lot of his work, just calling them nocturnes, the song to the night. You mind calling it a nocturne? Chopin said, call it whatever you wish. But to me, it is a song dedicated to the river sin. Mm. But 
When it was published as a nocturne, Chopin did continue. And he wrote a second nocturne. And he wrote a third. And so on and on and on and on. And on. Yes. And the last nocturnes are quite different from the first one. Yes, they are. Yes. They are. So it doesn't matter what you call it, just so long as it's a beautiful thing that can take you to another world, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is a beautiful, uh, beautiful story, what you are telling us. But it means also tells us that Chopin was very much thinking about music. We have the division sometimes, critics of absolute and program music. But Chopin always tried to envision things from his life. So he was always thinking with his imagination some beyond the notes, in fact. Not the particular structure, oh, that must be sonata form, something like classical music, just pure music. He had some envisions of the things related to his life. Well, it was a music without, it didn't have titles like Schumann liked to do, of course, his friend, but, yeah. but it, it also shows that he was thinking in this way when he was composing, which yeah. is also very important, right? I think for, for the pianist to think in this way when they play, that this is always about something. You mentioned this is a language. That's also another thing in your book. Beautiful that music is a language, language. But you know, I want to ask you because I'm from Poland and, and um, about Poland because the birthplace of Chopin. Yeah. Recently, I read a beautiful article about you in the Polish newspaper. But I want to ask you about your memories with Poland. And do you have specific also memories uh, if you can tell a, a little bit about that. Well, I was in Poland. Mm -hmm. Very short visit. Very short. Very short visit. I went as a uh, judge of the Chopin competition. Mm -hmm. and I stayed in a hotel near the main street. And I was able to walk up and down that main street. I saw the church where uh, Chopin's heart. His heart, yes, the cross. Yeah. It's called Holy Cross Church. Yes, and I tried to imagine that I am as close to Chopin mm -hmm. as I can be in this church. And it was a wonderful thought. And I walked a little bit further. And on my right-hand side is the president's home. Yes. In Poland. Palace, Palace, Palace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And I tried to imagine the family of Chopin, you see, his father was a professor. That's right. He lived on the main street and they had no babysitters, no such thing. <laughs> so when there was a ball, the president of Poland would open up the hole and all the people could come and they walked across the street a couple of blocks further down and they walked to the president's home and they went in there and there would be a ball every once in a while. Mm, and that's right. Ball meant that there was dancing and there was a little balcony above the large salon, the main room, and the orchestra people would be sitting up in that balcony and playing music. And the people downstairs were expected to dance to it. And there was a little corner by the kitchen where the people didn't dance so much because the waiters had to go in and out. And that's where the children were put. And I was a child at that time. I was imagining I was put in that little corner and I would be dancing around mm -hmm. in that corner. And that's how Chopin grew up dancing in that corner with his sister. Sister, maybe. sister, yes, yes. I think you have been to so many competitions, right? For as a jury member. Yes. So yes. what do you generally think about the competition? Do you advise young pianists to participate in the competitions? Well, there's no harm in it. Mm -hmm. And it does give a goal to a young person. So that it's very good. There mm -hmm. are also uh, things uh, in addition to that, the young person has an opportunity to listen to people from other places mm -hmm. and perhaps learn and perhaps make friends. One of the most wonderful things about being an artist 
is that they get to meet other artists. And you can make friends with those people and they're wonderful people all your life long. You have a friend in here, you have a friend there. Yeah, I remember, I remember meeting people like Rudolf Serkin and Adolf Bush in South America in a restaurant. <laughs> it, it was just like meeting your cousin. <laughs> it was such fun. And we had good times all over the world together like that. Mm. I saw <laughs> Isaac Stern in San Francisco once. <laughs> I saw Ruggiero Ricci in Morocco once. So uh, you can make friends that way. It's wonderful mm. to have friends in the business. And it's the same while you're a competition uh, aspirant. You make friends and they can be lifelong friends if you are. That's great. I, I, that's a great point of view, you know, not yes. a competition itself, but meeting people, different artists. That's, that's it. That's, that's it. That's awesome. a good way to think about this. Yeah. Yes. You know, this year we're going to have super competition. Of course, I'm going to, I'm looking forward because last year, I'm sure, as you know, it was postponed because of the current situation, right? But last year at the Chopin and Friends Festival, when I was also directing, we had this little topic about the synesthesia, about artists who connect colors with sounds. And I want to ask you an individual personal question. Do you think that each pianist has a different color? And do you believe in that? Well, I think sound has a different color. So, yes, sound. sound. Sound, each artist has a particular Aura. That when I think of this artist, I, th I think of a set of qualities that belong to that artist. Character. Of the yeah, sound. it's like I think I, I can pick myself out in a group of recordings. I don't know how, but that's me. Yes. That's Claudio Laurel over there. I can pick him out. Mm -hmm. You can pick it. Yes. Kissim. I can pick him out. <laughs> that's amazing you know that's amazing thing you know because mm -hmm. uh, you know the sound of the piano is you have a hammers but every piano is playing on the same instrument yeah. creating such a difficult uh, different sound completely different yeah. sound you know uh -huh. but i want to now ask you about different thing about your re uh, memories recording this deca album with Liszt and chopin so many pieces you recorded recently yeah. it was uh, also renewed we can hear on Spotify and the other. I was listening, I was so impressed with all of those beautiful recordings. Yeah. I was using a lot of Chopin. And you, what are your memories? Do you remember? And how do you remember that, that time when you recorded so many of those pieces? Well, of course, the 18s are sort of special. Yeah. So to me, for this reason, I had small hands, not mm -hmm. still small, but they were not very strong and not big enough to play those important compositions that my father knew I had to play. I mean, how can you be a concert pianist if you cannot play all these compositions? So in order to strengthen my hands, we treated the Chopin etudes as exercises to strengthen my hands. Actually, he wrote them for that purpose. Chopin himself decided he did not like the sound of churning exercises all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So car he, wrote car, car mm -hmm. he wrote something to replace those churning exercises that were ugly. And he wrote something beautiful. And other composers followed his example. Debussy, for example, was given the job by Durham the French uh, publisher mm -hmm. to uh, edit the etudes, edit all the works of Chopin at one time. And he went to his work, he said, etudes, etudes, etudes. Why, I can write etudes also. <laughs> and so he was inspired to write his book of etudes. So Chopin inspired other composers as well as performers. And I had to learn these etudes 
for the sake of strengthening my two hands. And so I worked hard on it until I had every one of those etudes. And then it was my obligation to go through all 24 etudes before I had breakfast every morning. Mm. <laughs> all 24? All 24. Oh, wow. Before I had breakfast, I had to do that. And in this way, my hands did get strong. And I did learn about fingering. And I did learn about how to produce a beautiful sound. <laughs> and so when I had the first opportunity to record for a company, yes, what would you like to record? I said, I want to record the 24 ages. Etudes. And that was my first. Mm. But you are the first ones, the first one who recorded all of those etudes. Yes. That's legendary. That's legendary and beautiful recording. That's yes. so extremely difficult for, uh, for the pianist. And yes. you did that, but you also recorded so many other pieces because yes. also for scherzos, for ballads, waltzes, sure. all those big pieces. Well, actually it was the director of DECA at that time who yeah. made me into a Chopin specialist because I didn't consider myself a specialist in any way. I played a lot of Beethoven, I played a lot of Bach, I played a lot of Mozart. Mozart. So I did not consider myself a Chopin specialist. But when those etudes came out, he said, you are a Chopin specialist with a specialist. name like yours mm. Why, in South America. I even saw these big, you know, the affiche advertisements of my concert. The Polish pianist, Ruth Slachowska, <laughs> came backstage and spoke Polish to me. I couldn't even answer. <laughs> I don't speak Polish. But when you listen to this, those amazing rec recordings, but what do you think nowadays your interpretation have changed? There may be particular things that you pay more attention or what do you think after? So later? many years later, mm -hmm. of course I, I do things differently than I did then. I have much more ability. I have had more experience, mm -hmm. more time. Time to grow, time to travel, time to listen. Of course, I think everything differently than I did in those days. What was amazing to me was that they were interested in reproducing all those things that I did before. I was absolutely amazed at that. Amazing recordings, amazing recordings. <laughs> but I was, I was personally so touched always, each of the etudes, I think Chopin love always start with other beats, like one note for the singers giving like in the songs. And all of those your other beats to the composition, like etude F major are so amazing. I have never heard such up beats in those, all of those etudes, even etude E major. And the sound quality, it's amazing. Those are unique recordings. Congratulations, really huge Thanks. bravo for this. This is a treasure for the piano, pianist, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad they, they, they renew that, you know, we can listen now and we can enjoy it so much. Yeah. And it's, we can also learn so much from this, those recordings. But Ruth, I also want to ask you about your pedagogues because you had many pedagogues and I bet some of them had a slight, as many artists, we all share similar things, but we might have different visions of particular elements. So what do you think that your teachers' pedagogues were different and what have you learned from the different teachers maybe? Or you oh, think- they... A long time I know. ago. I, mean, I, know, I know, but you remember it, very it well. It has been put inside of me such a long time ago and it's had a chance to move and grow. It's hard to say what came from whom, okay, but you. from everybody I got a an enormous amount of information and ways to think, ideas. For instance, I still remember Schnabel. Mm -hmm. After Schnabel. Very, very important. He would say about closing a phrase is never fight with your neighbor. Be that sure that, that you leave on a happy note. 
so that when you close a phrase or you close a musical idea, be careful that it is beautifully done, that it is neat. Mm -hmm. Another idea is when you have small uh, phrases, try to make up words for them. Like I was playing F major Mozart sonata and I had a passage that went da 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 bum, da 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 bum. And he said, Ina bloom, Ina bloom, a flower, a flower. Mm. Wanted it to have a, an idea, not just four notes. That's good. But you started with a composer and pianist, Rachmaninoff, because Rachmaninoff has an amazing pianist yes. and a composer. But I would like to ask you, I'm particularly also interested in composition as a composer, but because Rachmaninoff, um, did he encourage also students to compose or improvise on the piano? Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember that? He used to improvise always. He used to. Mm. Do the lessons, right? Also improvising. In those days at a piano concert, some of the older pianists, such as Rachmaninoff, mm -hmm. would start with the while you are playing a program, you say, for instance, the first piece might be in C minor, second piece might be in F sharp major. So between the C minor piece and the F sharp major piece, he would improvise a set of chords very, very softly, just himself alone and lead the audience ear from C minor to F sharp major. It was a most marvelous thing. And then when he finished the F sharp major piece, he would take the audience into the key of the next piece on the program. So that part of the program that that artist played would be improvisation. That's unbelievable. That's great. I never heard but about this. That's that's what they did in those days. Mm -hmm. That's why a piano concert was an entirely different experience then to mm. what it is now. So, but that's also very different approach because they think about this as a one. But it's no no nowadays nobody does that. So the, so but that's beautiful thing that even the, on the concert thinking about connecting different keys. You know that's. Yeah. But you know, as a Rachmaninoff, as a professor and teacher, did he encourage students, his piano students, not a composition minor, but you know, to also compose or not? Well, he didn't encourage me to compose. I think he that didn't. my forte was more in performing mm -hmm. than in composing. Because, you know, I was thinking also very much, I'm thinking very much as a Rachmaninoff because it's very unique in the history of music. If you're going to go back, Mm -hmm. that the, we have a wonderful performer and amazing uh, pianist. Yes. A lot of those great masters, master composer, even if we think about the Prokofiev, even just they gave up for a moment piano. You know, even Shostakovich was a great pianist, but they gave up for composition. And of Ostravinsky or, or, or the others also pianists. But Rachmaninoff is exception. Is very much exception because he could combine those two elements, being a wonderful pianist and a wonderful composer. And I was thinking, excuse me, there was a reason for that. Yes, what he was had the reason? To earn money. Oh, you see. And he could not earn money by composing. Oh, that's a very important point. So yes. he had to play. That's a very important point. And in order to play, he had to give up to a certain extent some of his composing time. I know that, you know that probably better, but because when he came to the New York, to the States, he didn't compose that much. I was looking for the catalog of his works and I was very surprised he didn't compose that much, just very little. He didn't have the time, he, he had to practice. So he right. couldn't, you know, he couldn't make a living from, from just writing music. Even yeah. like Chopin, we think about Chopin, he was teaching a lot in Paris. He was very exhausted from all those lessons. Yes, because well, he had to earn money. There you go. to earn money. He had to earn money. You know, it's very hard to uh, combine those two things. You know, Prokofiev was a great pianist, by the way. I, I was reading also 
but he gave up um, gave up uh, concert life. Bartok also teacher, and if we're going to think about Bartok, right? He was yeah. having recitals, but they gave up for composition. But Rachmaninoff gave up for piano. In fact, later yeah. he could compose more piano concertos, more symphonies, but. Yeah. You know, but do you, which advice you uh, you would give for the young pianists nowadays, for their career, for maybe you can give like a short advice that we can tell to the young artists and pianists nowadays. They have to follow their own star. Mm -hmm. They have to have a vision of themselves, of what they want to do. And then work for that vision work 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 do what you can to make that vision come true also there is this to consider make as many friends as you can so go to competition also because make friends <laughs> yes. make, fr make friends not only with musicians but with everybody because a little bit of that friendship will enter into your sound. If you are a good friend, you will have a good sound. If you are not, it will be weaker. Make as many friends as you can and keep in mind what you want to sound like, what you want to do for yourself. Who you are. Succeed. Yeah. yeah. So, so always find yourself, you know, always be yourself, be yourself. Be yourself, but don't, don't wrap yourself up. <laughs> be yourself, but open up. Be yourself and always change yourself. Be yourself and always change, be open for changes. Yes. Changes. But do you also recommend um, young artists to listen to modern works? Absolutely. And go, you also do that, yeah? Yes. yes. You do that. Mm -hmm. Going to a mo uh, modern art, uh, yeah. watch the modern museums, right? This is very important, mm -hmm. especially if you don't like it at first. Oh, yes, that's very important. There's something strong there that turns you off. All right. What is there that turns you off? You find out what that thing is and you find out, hey, this is not so bad. This is a good idea. You know, I'm also thinking very much, this is something really amazing what you mentioned now. Because sometimes, even if you go in the back in the history of music, for some people I ask, they didn't like Bartok, for example. Yes, because exactly. at the beginning, it starts harsh. Mm -hmm. On the surface, it is harsh. But beyond that, on below, it is such a beautiful soul and everything what is the most important. So sometimes at the first time when we judge things, we might be not right. We might not know that we like it. We might not know what is there. Yeah. And we need time for that time for that to grow with this music with this art sometimes at the first place it's important not to abandon i think because we very quickly i don't know i have a feeling we like to have tendency oh i don't like it and i don't care about this but actually you like it you just don't know you like it okay. because you didn't discover that but you know how do you feel with the students when they they are particular they, they might say oh i don't like it i don't want to play this piece and what do you say to the students then? That hasn't happened to me because I'm That's careful about what I give them. Ah, okay. So very, you... very careful about what I give them. I give them a tiny little taste of it. Mm -hmm. and... Step by step, step by step. Mm -hmm. yep. so that's the way, step by they, step too. They usually like what I give them because mm -hmm. I give them such a small little taste and then they acquire a taste for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But so do you encourage your students very much also to read about music? Yes, and to go to museums. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I am in New York, I take a student with me whenever I go to a museum. Or to Met Museum, Metropolitan Museum. I take three or four students with me when I go to a museum mm -hmm. because it's more fun that way. They can discuss it all together and we have fun over lunch maybe talking about everybody's favorite and what happens and it's a happy experience for all of us mm -hmm. and it can't help but be part of them and they'll put it into their music too 
So maybe no, I'm just thinking now we are going slowly to the end with this beautiful conversation. I want to thank you very much with this, all your memories. I wish that you will also play in Poland, maybe birthplace of Chopin someday, that you also share your talents, a specialty of Chopin in his place. So in Zelazowa Wola, the, okay. which is very close to Warsaw. So, but I wish you, first of all, thank you very much that you will play at the festival this year, at the opening, you will play Chopin for us at the Polish consulate. I wish you all, all good energy and everything uh, going well. So great to see you in a, such a good spirit, you know. And I'm just thinking now at the end, I would love to choose you to choose. Maybe one etude that you would like us to listen from this recording that you recorded. C can you choose one maybe selection that we can, we can listen at the end of this conversation? Maybe the E major, opus 10, number three. Okay, this one that Chopin has is the most beautiful melody they have ever written, which has a, such a long line, right? This one, E major, number three. It's, it is something that shows the passage of time. Oh, passage of time. Mm -hmm. Because when I was young, I heard it one way, and then it changed, and I heard it in another way. I must have heard it in 15 different ways during my life. And now I hear it in a completely different way and present it in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. But it's very dramatic in the center. And the beginning is so nice, but this middle section is so dramatic and he has such a, sounds like from Bartok because we have this diminish chords, yeah. diminish everything. And the those sequence- six, Those sixths that go. Yes, very like dramatic, the all the piano. Yes. Yes. But it's that good. isn't the way to think of an etude. You think of an etude as a piece of music mm -hmm. and what that piece of music leaves when it is over, what it leaves inside of you, what you feel. Do you have any vision with this, like uh, with this middle section? Do you see something particular? You, maybe you can, uh, you can imagine something. What is this middle section in this piece for you, for you? Well, as I said, over the time it has represented Different things. Different things. Beginning. But now, but I mean today, I mean today, you know, for example. Rough, roughness. Roughness, roughness rough passages in your life mm. and you're leaving them behind you. The rough passages are smoothed out, if you remember. Mm. Dee -da -dee -da -da. Right after those rough passages. They're smoothed out, they're smoothed away, they're smoothed away, they've gone away. You are past those. And life still goes on, and it's beautiful. It's more beautiful than it was before. And it's something that you can live with and be happy with and be satisfied with and enjoy. Mm. Look forward to more. Beautiful. Thank you very much. So this with this story and this kind of interpretation, I mean, uh, in this thought of this piece, I think it would be wonderful for us to listen now, this your recording. And uh, thank you very much and finish this conversation. And we are very much looking forward for your performance in November. Right. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Maestra, for a time with us, for answering all those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your interest. That's what keeps things going. Thank you very much. Thank you all the best from my country, also from Poland, and all the best for you. for you. Thank you very much. Without we listen after this conversation, etude number three performed by Luz Lenczyska, opus 10 number three by Frederick Schott. So please enjoy the lesson. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.